I am going to teach some of the ways that I use to cultivate focus and get into my creative practice when I don't really feel like working and how to create, how to nurture my individual voice. So I'm excited to be here today and thank you for joining us. I am going to talk about a lesson that I am sharing in a book that I have just coming out called The Path of Drawing. And in this book, it's about introducing yourself to drawing, learning concepts and realist drawing. But even more importantly to me, it is about how to encourage yourself in a creative habit. I think we all have issues like focus. Can you focus? I think during the pandemic, especially, we were all dealing with a lot of challenges to being able to concentrate in the studio. So I'm going to share some of my ideas about how to focus and some simple rituals. Also in this book, people often ask me, where do your creative ideas come from? And I think that there's an idea that an artist just naturally comes with a lot of creative ideas and inspiration. But in fact, that has not really been my experience. My experience was that I absolutely loved drawing and painting, and I just wanted to keep doing that. And then when I was really ready to start becoming more a professional artist, I had to figure out how do I cultivate my own ideas and find my own individual voice. So that's one of the, those are the two ideas I'm going to share with you today. Just doing some easy exercises that I like to do in my studio when almost, I don't even feel like working, but I know if I just get myself into the studio and start working, then that inspiration is going to build. Ideas are going to flow. I think that's exactly right. And I want to learn more about that. I should just mention that Patty's, I'll, I'll just reiterate, she's got a new book out. I tried to get one here in time for this broadcast. It's probably somewhere between there and here. but So I was going to show it. But uh, Patty uh, has my full recommendation because I knew everything she does is great. <laughs> and the the Dreamliners, uh, which is uh, the group that kind mm-hmm. of people who follow this show, the Dreamliners have a book club. And so we'll make sure that we get them to encourage your book in the Dreamliners book club. Right there, you're guaranteed to sell two, 3,000 copies. I've so. gotten to know some of those Dreamliners well, and they're just such an enthusiastic group. So yeah, they that will be are. great. I'd love to connect with you guys. <laughs> okay. All right. Take it away. Okay. So I'm actually going to change my camera now, and I'm going to move to my camera that's going to show the view of my materials. So there's the um, image of my book. This book um, has a lot of chapters on how to begin a creative practice. So one of the things I'm going to talk about today is this concept called spiral your way in. Right. So here's a little preview of the book. It has simple lessons in realist drawing, introduction to using value. And then lastly, ideas about how we use creativity to develop ideas uh, and compositions. So during my demo today, I'll share a few different ideas from the book. three concepts that are really important in building a creative habit. When, when are you going to do it? It's very simple to say, I want to, but if you don't plan a time and a place, it can be easy to let it go and let something else, maybe dealing with your family, take priority. And so the first thing you need to do is make a commitment to when you're going to do it and where you're going to do it. It's also a great idea to get your materials out ahead of time. Sometimes what I do is in the evening when I'm going to bed and I know in the morning I want to do something, I will get my materials out so that they are ready to use in the morning and just sitting there in front of me. This project today, I am using a mixed media sketchbook and a mixed media sketchbook has a thick paper. So it's uh, oh, it's about 140 pounds. You can hear it it's almost like a card stock. And that thick paper means that I can paint on it with watercolor. I could put marker on it. I could use all sorts of different materials and it won't bleed through. 
And what I do over time is that I often will use watercolor, like here is a really simple page, to just hand tone the paper so that then the next day I've got something ready that started. It's not a blank page anymore. And it invites me to kind of come in and make something. Sometimes I like to just play with the watercolor and make it in a more interesting shape just to see what the watercolor does. And by doing these small projects in my sketchbook, it sort of propels me forward the next day. They say, you know, to begin is to be half done. And so that's the principle here. Today, I'm going to show you how I like to make a simple watercolor circle as a way of preparing my materials for a net for the for a project. So let me get started with that. I actually drew already drew the circle today. I just traced a china plate. You could use a plastic lid, anything. I just find that making a circle a shape, it gives me, it sort of gives a composition or it, it invites some ideas, some creative ideas. At any shape would be good, or you could just do the whole page. But I like circles personally, so I do that. So the next thing I do is I'm just going to make this whole circle wet. The brushes that I'm using are these Casaneo Da Vinci watercolor brushes. These are actually these big like squirrel mops that hold a lot of water. And I know you can't see the water very much on the screen right now. You can see now, oh, I can see where it's wet. By simply flooding the water into the circle and I'm just letting the tip of the brush touch that pencil edge. It doesn't really matter too much if you go outside the line. It really, it's very forgiving. But by making this whole circle wet, and I'm gonna look from the side and kind of check, see, yes, is there water everywhere? Yes. Get that circle wet. Now I'll set that big mop brush aside. And I have this plate, and I just have two colors of watercolor. One is a hooker's green deep, one is alizarin crimson. I often will just pick two colors that I like, a red and a blue, a blue and a yellow. I picked red and green because it's holidays. I have just two brushes in clean water and I'm gonna make a little bit of a puddle, one with the red and one with the green. This, is, this exercise is really about intuitive and free expression. There is not a right or a wrong. And it also, it's a, just a way of, by putting the brush to the paper, it is focusing my mind on what I'm doing. So instead of worrying about, am I doing the right thing or what am I gonna wait, make, the colors, the materials themselves just invite me into creative space, watching the colors puddle. So in that wet wash, the colors tend to drag and pull in the puddles, which I really love the effect of. And I like to look just the way that they do that. The colors are beautiful and it engrosses me into my creative practice. So in this case, all I'm doing is I've loaded my brush into that puddle, I've laid it on, and I'm letting it sort of pool into that wet and just seeing what happens. I'm going to use two colors in this case. So I'm going to put red up top, and you see how it sort of pulls the it puddles into those wet, the wet water. where the red and green run together. You'll see that uh, maybe they'll make kind of a purpley or brownish color. I make uh, a lot of these as a way to just get started with my practice when I need to focus and enjoy and get some joy in the studio. I think when we spend more and more time drawing and painting, Sometimes the pressure builds and we feel like we stopped having fun in the studio, which is what took us there in the first place. So this little creative 
intuitive exercise as a way for me to connect with the more childlike quality of art making. If it puddles too much, I'll just take a little paper towel, set it into the wet and lift it off. Um, I sometimes actually like the way if I tip it and it drags and pulls one way or the other, what it does. So you can see that it doesn't take me very long. And I'll make um, sometimes two or three of them on different sheets, either at the very end of the day when I want to relax before bed or at the very beginning of the day. And let's see, I should have some more in here. And then sometimes I'll come back in and I'll make a more complete drawing the next day on top of these little circles. Here's one that's just kind of like messy green and blue, but because of the colors being more like a landscape, they can kind of start to evoke a feeling of a landscape. So I find it's a way of prompting my imagination and my subconscious to start creating images um, almost intuitively. So that is one part of this uh, exercise a thing that I love to do to just kind of jumpstart my creative practice. Um, those of you who know my work know that I do a lot of figurative work, a lot of portrait work. It can be quite sort of rigorous. You have to draw carefully. Sometimes you're frustrated because your work didn't go well exactly the way you wanted. And I really just like these simple, approachable, beautiful puddles of color because it just reignites the joy of my practice in the studio. I'm gonna show you some little bit more about drawing, but there's one more thing I wanna teach you about um, how to cultivate your intuition and creative ideas. This is something that I call creative compost. And so as I am going about everyday life, oftentimes you find pictures in a magazine that inspire you, you know, a little drawing that I cut out of the newspaper. Um, actually, no, I think that's from Fine Art Connoisseur of Leonardo da Vinci drawing, postcards from uh, some friends whose work I admire, um, things that inspire me. And I collect them. This is a plastic portfolio book that you get at Staples. And it has empty plastic sleeves. So then what I will do is I'll just take all those notes and you can see there's like notes to myself, sometimes even just lists, things that are interesting me. And then I will put them in the book and just collect them as a place to keep these this ephemera. Then what I do is that over time, I will go back to it and I will flip through and I will see that there are certain ideas and themes that I maybe collect more than once. Oh, I have a whole bunch of pictures of gray cloudy skies or I know I collect a lot of images of birds and wings and I'm kind of interested in that pictorial language. Um, I'm interested in these, this is a caryatid and it's from um, the Parthenon in Greece. And so I'm interested in those kinds of figures. And so by collecting them here in this book, it teaches, I can learn about my own interests. I can notice repeating patterns. I can see that there's like maybe a vibrant color or a color relationship. I think, oh, that is a gorgeous painting. I love that vivid color. And then maybe find something else in my book that is similar in color, in value, in vividness. And that helps me get an idea like, oh, I would love to make a still life full of vivid color like this one. Um, blues, sometimes an artist too is really different from me. Um, sometimes an old master. And I, this is where I'll collect these and flip through them. And then they become my personal source book for creative ideas. So that's creative compost. And then what I can do when I'm coming into the studio and I want to just do a small in, you know, creative project is maybe I'll pull something that I have found. This is a photo actually by my friend who's a photographer, Stefan Hagen. And then I'll think, well, why don't I just do a little study of this as a way to um, have a short 20 to 30 minute drawing project? I think it's really healthy to have short, quick projects instead of everything that you're doing, taking maybe, you know, multiple hours or days. 
I think to feed our creative habit, sometimes it's really pleasing to do something quick. So I'm gonna use this. And I prepped a couple of those watercolor circles. Um, you know, they take an hour or so to dry. I often do them the night before, and then I'll come back in and start working the next day. So here's one that I made last night and ready for this. Sometimes I can almost imagine something in there. So if you're interested in doing imaginative work, that can be, you can just then think about that. So I kind of like to use the shapes and colors as a way to prompt my imagination and intuition. Before I start the demonstration on this, there's one, a couple more things I want to show you that I often do when I'm sitting down and I want to be able to focus, but I haven't been able to get there yet. This is this simple ritual that sometimes I will start when I first open my sketchbook and I'm trying to get myself to concentrate. It's simply called spiral your way in. It is as simple as it sounds. All I am doing is putting my pencil on the paper and tracing a spiral. And usually I try to be very quiet at this time. And I let my mind drift, maybe notice the things that I am thinking about that are cluttering up. Oh, I forgot to call my mom. Oh, don't forget to pick up the prescription. Um, you know, what are the things that distract us and clutter our mind? And maybe I'll just notice them. There's something about the trail of the paper, of the pencil on the paper, that helps bring my mind fully into the present. So I'm really just doodling. There isn't really a distinction between doodling and drawing. It's really just the name we give to that activity. Everyone feels very comfortable saying, oh yes, I can doodle. But sometimes when you give it the language of drawing, then you start to think, oh, I can't draw. I don't know how to draw a straight line. But if you can write your name, you can draw. So sometimes these simple spirals are a lovely way for me to also arrive on my page. So I'm going to slow down a little bit. I'll zoom in my camera just a tiny bit. And I cut this little sheet is separate, but usually I have it in within that. I just keep it within my little um, idea sketchbook. When I begin drawing, the very first thing I need to do is I need to map out the placement of what I'm planning on drawing. I don't want to get into any details. I just want to map out on my picture where everything is going to go. What size do I want it? How big? How small? How do I want it to fit? And it's actually one of the things I like about the circle is it forces me already to be thinking about composition. And I'm just like, no, I want this to be a little bit higher. So these are block in lines. I am trying to keep these lines light, but so you can see them a little bit better on camera. I'm going to put them a little bit darker. If you're going to do something like this on your own, I encourage you to start these first lines very delicately so that you can erase. Again, mapping out where you want to put your picture. I want to make sure this whole bird fits more or less on this page. So that's what I'm thinking about, the proportion of the, pay, of the bird 
and mapping out placement. You see, I'm not spending too much time in any one place. Now I like that wingspan. So I think actually I'll break the boundary of that circle and go ahead and just let the wingspan cross over into the empty space around the circle. This kind of exercise is well suited to any drawing material. You could do it in color pencil. If you're bold, you could do it in ink. Ink works really nicely on these watercolor circles because it shows up really brightly. I love to work in graphite when I'm just doing things for myself in my studio because I find graphite so relaxing, so easygoing. I know I can erase it. I know I can change it. Now, I do sort of like the way that bird is perched on that flower. So thinking about placement, I'm also going to include something of that shape. And again, maybe I can kind of cross off outside the circle, take that composition, sort of break the boundary of that circle a little bit. So you see all of those preliminary lines, there's no detail at all. What I want to do is find just the placement and size and proportion. I might do things like check some measurements and check the measurement of, say, the height of the bird and compare it to the length of the wing if I'm having trouble with my proportion. Make sure the wings are really long enough. Sometimes we underestimate the length of a long distance. We tend to make things a little bit shorter and fatter. So sometimes comparing the heights and length of the, you know, the, dis the distance from there to there to something else on your reference can be really helpful. And again, at the, my, the quality of my line, it's called a block in line, it's light and straightish. I'm not trying to make a refined contour line. A refined contour line would be more like a hard line like this and maybe, you know, making, trying to make a hard line that has just a clear um, shape like that. I don't want a line like that. Instead, I want this sketchy block in line. The long straight lines help me check my proportion. And also those hard contour lines really do not erase well. Whereas the block in lines being light erase and it gives you the freedom to correct and move things around. So when you first start your picture, you want to use that light line called the block in line. All right, now that I have my plant, my block in placed, I am going to start doing more detail in each area. Um, the bird has the character of the bird really is from this, um, the way his eye is looking at you. I am more interested in the shapes. So not each individual detail of the feather, the eye, et cetera. I'm interested in the shapes of like the shape of the beak, the shape of the dark patch around the eye. And now that I've planned the placement of that contour, I can refine it and I'll use a kneaded eraser rolled into a little point. So it's a little bit of an illusion. Sometimes when an artist creates a line that looks like it's just perfectly drawn in the first place, actually that line has been planned out and the actual finished contour line is often the very last thing that I'm doing. Again, I'm going to keep working on shape. Want a little bit of light and shadow on this. So I'm focusing first on the body. 
And I'm going to go ahead and sort of shade in this called just hatching. By coloring in a big mass area on top of the dried watercolor, the bird itself will start to have more substance on top of this chaotic colorful space, the all the different watercolors, because they have so much um, interest in them themselves, then sometimes you need a little bit stronger line or graphic with the with your subject to make it pop. To make things go faster with my drawing, I might use a blending stump. A blending stump is just a roll of paper. And if I know I kind of want a big, flat, even tone, what's really happening is, is it's uh, smudging the graphite into that paper and it darkens it and evens the tone. So now I kind of, I have, I'm gonna, with the wing too, I kind of like the way it has this, the blue shape here and then the individual wings here. So anywhere there's sort of a big dark shape, I'll just mass that in. So in drawing, there's all sorts of different um, qualities or things we might focus on. Sometimes we focus on line and contour. Sometimes we use the material to make a tone, which means a flat area of value instead of using line. So that's called a mass tone. And you can see it goes quickly. And now let me do the other wing. I am just copying the shapes. So breaking down the large complex wing shape into subcomponents and smaller areas and trying to simplify a large area so that then I'll have some places where I'll put in small details. In drawing as in painting and any work can be really nice to have a range so you have some areas in your drawing that have a lot of fine detail and other areas where it's just delicate. So now I've kind of masked in those dark areas. And this is the part where actually I find it now starts to get fun and relaxing. I've planned out where I'm gonna put everything. And now I am changing gears a little bit and just working on one little area at a time. Looking at my reference, sometimes with an area like this, you might even count and say, oh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six feathers in that little area. And it's right here at this particular stage of the drawing where I really am noticing that I'm finally, after all of this, you know, the watercolor, the pencil, sharpening my pencil, now I'm really just starting to enjoy and think about drawing itself, how it feels to be um, in this chair with these materials, connecting with my creative practice. So all of, you know, that introductory spiraling, the watercolor, I have come to understand about myself that it takes time to arrive at our creative practice. It doesn't always just, you're not just instantly there in flow. You don't, necessarily know as soon as you hit the studio what it is you want to do. So I find that instead of feeling like the, I have, the, have to have the pressure of 
knowing exactly what I want to make, if I just allow myself to get engrossed in a small project like this, that the creative act itself will nurture me into a state of flow. And now at this moment, maybe more creative ideas are starting to emerge about, oh, maybe I'd like to do this. Or if you do this repeatedly and you've pulled, you know, this thing out of your creative compost or that, over time you start to get a, more of a sense of, oh, I really am interested in this subject matter. Maybe you start to think about um, the subject itself. You know, a lot of people, a lot of us get a lot of inspiration from nature. Um, there's the importance of um, preserving, protecting nature, maybe um, taking care of bees and birds that are our pollinators that help take care of us. Um, and so if you just allow yourself these simple projects, they let your mind flow and you can start to have a conversation with yourself about what you're really interested in. I think sometimes when we're procrastinating, we're not really sure what we wanna do. It was actually very helpful to me at one point to really come to understand that that procrastination is because I'm so like I absolutely want whatever I do to go really well and sort of be perfect but then it's very hard to do anything perfect so then you don't do it's very hard to get started everything you do is perfect Patty <laughs> well there's a lot of things you don't see right and that's the case with all of us we can't compare our insides to other people's outsides because what other people might show you that's the finished work is the result of a long process. But when you're in your studio, you're not so sure it's like going so well. Um, and I really struggle with those feelings just as much as anybody, um, just as much as any beginner. Um, and I think I've come to understand as a teacher is the real reason that people are have a hard time sustaining their creative practice or really pursuing their dreams have nothing to do with their, you know, can you hatch? Can you, um, do you know how to, is your proportion good? Ultimately, those things actually are not that important because you can learn to hatch if you're just patient. But the real barrier is these negative voices that are like this dumb little picture of, I didn't even draw the proportion right for this. You this, are this, this, not this a good hummingbird. And like, how are you ever going to get anyone? You know, and your negative voices start rising up. Okay. I want everybody to put the negative voices in the comments. What are the <laughs> right? negative voices that you always hear? We're going to overcome them today. Yeah. And if you think that I don't have those, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you know, I'm, I really do. And even though I've been drawing and painting for a very long time, in fact, maybe even the pressure builds because then like maybe I've had a few successes, but now like people are really maybe expecting me to do a great job. Well, what if I really mess up or what if I take a risk on something and people really think it's dumb? What if I just do something dumb, right? That's like, we all do those things. What's the dumbest thing you've ever done? <laughs> What's the dumbest thing I've ever done? Oh, I, I drove my husband's car. Like it was a, um, a stick shift and I hadn't drawn a stick shift in a really long time. And I was like, oh yeah, I totally know how to do that. And it lurched forward and hit a cinder block wall and the cinder block wall, uh, crumbled and all the cinder blocks like ended up on the top of the car. <laughs> well, that's pretty dumb. It was pretty dumb. <laughs> I was, no. I think, I think that was the most embarrassed I have ever been. But nobody we were died. just dating at the time too. It wasn't, you know, and he married you anyway. He must love <laughs> he <did>. you. 
He did. Well, I bet anytime you rent a car and you go on a trip, you don't get a stick shift. But I've also made, you know, I've made dumb paintings. I've made, you know, lots, so much bad art, you know. Um, Sometimes things work out great. A lot of the time they really don't work out. I've come to understand, actually, that if I am not uh, sometimes making pretty bad art, I'm probably not growing enough. Well, you know, I, I think everybody does it. One of the one of the eye openers for me, Patty, was I was on the phone one day with Richard Schmid, and he was telling me about all the stupid, dumb paintings that he had done over the years, and that you know, it, though they are fewer and fewer, that he still does them. And yeah, there was something freeing and powerful about that that made me think, well, wow, even Richard Schmid has a failure once in a while, and that somehow made me feel better. It absolutely does. And <laughs> us, you know, often, you know, an artist you admire, a wonderful professional, um, you know, you get the feeling that that that's not that doesn't happen to them at all. And it, it's really it's not true. Um, and I'm very grateful to um, to my teachers who have have been able to let me see, oh, you know, their failures, their unfinished paintings. Um, or even just to talk about our struggles, you know, that uh, maybe going through a period of depression or a period where you really maybe had a lot going on with family or work and you just really could not work um, and you felt disconnected from your creative self. Um, and the when you spend time with artists, you really come to understand that those are very, very common, that we all churn through these periods of sometimes very productive, sometimes really not um, and that's just normal. And so learning- Kathy, Kathy Anderson says in the comments, I hear myself thinking that my artwork looks like a kindergartner drew it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of negatives in here. You guys get them on the, get them written down and then tell yourself never to, to tell so yourself. One of the here. things that I have started doing in when, because I've, I have all of these negative comments that I hear, you know, will say to myself, oh, this is terrible. Oh, this proportion is really messed up. This is not going what I will. I have a practice now of instead of having like positive self-talk. So I was talking with a friend about um, like when a kid brushes their teeth, sometimes you're like, hey, great job. You brushed your teeth. You know, as adults, to be honest, if somebody was like, hey, great job, you brushed your teeth, you would probably feel better. And I think that we have to speak to ourselves, to our inner artist child, and just constantly be like, hey, I'm really proud of you for sitting down to work for a few hours today. So you're what you're saying is you have conversations with yourself? Absolutely. And in fact, I really have, um, I try to make a point to if I start to think, hear myself be negative, I will counter it with something positive and say something positive to myself. Like, what would you say to your best friend? Or what would you say to your child? If they, you know, were like, oh, this is going terribly. What would you say? Get your homework done. Stop worrying about that stuff. Get your homework done. Right. (laughs) So what can you say to yourself in that moment? And we really do our brains respond to programming and repetition. And if you you can build a positive habit, um, just well, maybe with a little bit more effort, there's something about the negative that just arises so simply. Well, but in, so the negative is a reptilian response. That's right. Our reptilian brain is trying to protect us, but we have to we ha- when we catch those negative thoughts, we have to say, you know, that's not like me. That's right. This isn't me. This is not who I am. I don't really believe that. You have to tell yourself that kind of stuff. That's right. So I have definitely adopted a habit of positive self-talk to kind of counter those negative voices. And it has really helped. It has made a big difference. Awesome. So this is really looking good, Patty. I mean, thank you. It's just a little, you know, it's just a fun little sketch. It is the kind of thing that I would do in my little book. Um, These are not projects that I typically show to anyone. 
Um, they are things that I simply do for my own pleasure as a way to get engrossed in something I'm doing. But then over time, oh, here's another project that is um, another way to use your creative compost where instead of using drawing and collage, and this can be a good way to kind of cultivate, like dig into, spend some time thinking about an idea you have on your mind. And collage can be a really good way to um, simplify and bring complex ideas together. Creativity is basically the recombination of existing ideas. And then a new idea emerges through that recombination. And the way that you're going to put those ideas together are going to be completely different than the way somebody else does. So doing these little projects is a way, this is actually this project called uh, Draw Your Monster. So if you're really having a hard time with these negative voices, why don't you think about actually personifying them? Like sometimes it's like have a conversation. What does What is the worst thing that could happen if you put a bunch of paint on that canvas, right? We have a fear like, oh no, what, you know, but, but really question it. Like why, why? why does your monster wear a necktie? Because it's about, it represents the idea of authority and particularly the idea of intellectual or like the authority of school, right? That in order you feel like to have a, a validating idea, well, you know, you've also got to have footnotes and a, a bibliography to back up your, your argument, right? This, and that kind of, um, it can really be very paralyzing to feel like, oh, well, I have a pretty good idea, but I really need to go read about 12 more books about it before I can really feel like I, I know what I'm talking about. So in thinking about, you know, drawing my monster, I kind of thought about these issues of, you know, the voice of authority of some expert who, you know, knows a lot more than I do or thinking about comparison. Um, so I, I, that's another way to sort of just tackle, tack, you know, have a conversation with it. Because okay, I, everybody you know, needs to draw their monster and then post it in the comments later. Right? I love it's it. It's very freeing. The yeah. other thing, like Eric was saying, our fear, our monsters, they are actually trying to protect us. They're trying to keep us safe. And so if you, you can't banish them. You can't tell them, you know, oh, you're not... Uh, I'm going to turn off my camera. Do, do you guys, do you want to see more of this, Eric? Yes, or yes I we do. Change my camera. Um, let me see what else. Do. I mean, this, because you know, of it, we on. discovered your monster. Um, yeah. Um, you're, so you, you want to make friends with your monster and you're going to continue to have a dialogue. Here's another one where it was an intuitive watercolor. I just did the watercolor. And then the next day or the next morning, I, from imagination, made a, a drawing on it. And this can be a nice way to kind of coax your imagination. If you don't have a lot of experience trying to draw things from you, the mind instead of observing, this is a nice way to do it. It's almost like a Rorschach, like trying to get it to suggest something. Um, so your monster, you can't banish it. You have to make friends with it. It's going to go with you and it, it is there to protect you. And it's a, a, kind, it's a, a, a part of the, yourself that you should love as well. But you must learn that your monster should never be allowed to be in charge of your creative work. So it might go along with you on the road trip of creativity, but you never, ever want to let it drive. This is a, another like an extended doodle project where instead of, you know, going from the spiral... Then you can kind of just do these, it's called a, I call it a hatching quilt. And then each in the, each of those crossings, you can actually practice your cross hatching or practice putting in an even area of tone and then blending it to just learn the simple skills of how to get your pencil to build some hand-eye coordination. So it's just silly doodles, but also you're learning things like stippling, hatching and cross hatching, blending, making tone. The more we just use our pencil and paper, it builds the connections in our neurons between our hand and our minds and our muscles. 
And these simple exercises strengthen your creativity. The more you do them, the more you're able to express, you know, complex ideas. I'm also very inspired by quotes. Um, this is a poem from Hafiz. It says, with passion, pray. With passion, work. With passion, make love. With passion, eat and drink and dance and play. Why look like a dead fish in this ocean of God? So if I find a poem like that that really inspires me to keep going with my creative practice, then I might come down in the morning, open my book to one of these pages where I've done a circle or a wash and find a way to take that poem. You know, we find bits of inspiration that are meaningful, but if you just flip the page, you're going to forget it. If you keep it, if you, you know, using that creative compost uh, book, if you keep it, you can make it a part of yourself and remind yourself when your negative voices are really rising up, you can flip through and remind yourself of what are your higher angels, you know, hoping and wanting you to do. Um, this is actually just a watercolor that's from a landscape. You know, I think I spent 10 minutes on it. It's the same concept of um, the watercolor wash where I basically made the whole paper wet and just did bands of color. So instead of doing it in a circle, I did it in a square and just it evokes a feeling of a landscape, but it couldn't be the simpler as far as the creative process. And projects like this are very, they just make me happy to be using my brush and my book. There's another one Never. like that. Well, let's see a couple more, then we'll have you come back on camera. I now, love you, this uh, tale. You do a thing every summer. Uh, I don't know if you, can I talk about what you do every summer? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Patty does the thing every summer, and I've been invited. I just haven't been able to make it uh, because I don't have enough bug spray. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, she always goes out uh, plein air painting for a few days every summer with a model and uh -huh. a few other painters, and they put the model out in, the, in nature and uh, just paint the model the whole time. I think that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, this is a watercolor that was done in that place in Pennsylvania. So um, I find also just by playing around with watercolor, I can do these quickly in like 30 or 45 minutes. And it just, it makes me feel happy to be at work. And then I'm ready to like, oh, now I'm ready to do something more. more to get you in the groove too. Well, yeah, you'll exactly. have to come up to the Adirondacks in the summertime. Absolutely. We can, we're going to make that happen. I wanted to mention also, uh, Patty's coming back here in a second, but Patty not only has a new book out, but she has a fabulous video from us, PaintTube.tv, uh, and there it is, uh, Portraits from Life with Patty Watwood. And I love the fact I remember having the discussion. Let's use the lady with the pink hair. I think that was a lot of fun. Patty, tell us a little bit about your, uh, uh, about your uh, portrait video real quickly. My portrait video is a complete demonstration showing how I go you start with a drawing then doing an underpainting in a limited palette just two colors burnt sienna and blue black it's a wonderful simple way to get started with an underpainting and then showing you how to use a full color palette for that rich color that pink hair those yellow flowers the ribbons so it shows you a classical approach to painting the portrait from life yeah, and it is outstanding. It's one of the earliest ones that we did and yeah. still doing really great. Thank you. Patty, congratulations on your new book. I'll tell everybody one more time that the book uh, is available. We'll put the link in the in the comments section. Uh, you want to just tell us one more time the name of the book and just give your best pitch? <laughs> yeah, thank you. So that's called The Path of Drawing, Lessons in Everyday Creativity and Mindfulness. And it is designed to help you nurture your creative voice, strengthen your creative habit, and enjoy a path of creativity. To be an artist is really just to embrace a path of creative work that will take you um, to most, the most beautiful places. So I hope you'll check it out. Absolutely. Patty, thank you for being on today. We're honored that you would do this. I know you're just launching this book. It's very exciting. And uh, we will visit you 
once you've had all this great success in your in your uh, in your new mansion or something. It's a plan. It's a plan. That sounds great, Eric. <laughs> Thank you so much for all you do to keep all of us inspired. It really. Oh. Your energy, your joy, it's what we all need. And thank you so much. 